Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're here. This, for, this is not what I was supposed to say at the beginning, but I'm going to. This is very nerve-wracking for me because I'm used to feedback and getting the audience here. Uh, by all means, please uh, feel free to um, ask questions. My very good friend Adina is here, and she's looking, and she will read me the questions, so don't worry. Anyway, this is how I was told to begin. Thank you for turning into Facebook Life to hear my story. My name is Marguerite Mishkin, and I am a hidden child of the Holocaust. So, uh, you know, usually when I begin speaking, I always say, which is true, and I'll say it today, I always speak, I always say that I have a purpose in speaking. Yes, it's interesting to tell uh, stories, and their very stories are very important, but there has to be a message behind it. And I used to wait till the end, and that never worked. And so I'm going to tell you right now. My message is a, a, a word that the museum uses a lot, and other people do too, to be an upstander. And as much as this virus is keeping us at home, it is also showing us how people are upstanders. We're all trying to help everybody. So, uh, and I also begin with this quote, and I really thought a little bit about beginning with it uh, today, and you'll see why, but I'm going to begin with it anyway. Uh, the quote that I begin with it is by Einstein, and it says, uh, the world is a dangerous place, which we certainly know today, uh, not because of, pe of those who do evil, but because of those who, s who see and do nothing. Well, thankfully, as I said, with this virus, people are doing something. They're listening and they're home. And the ones that can be home, uh, people are helping them as much as they can. Okay, so let me begin my story. And my story begins, as all stories do, with my biological parents. And I purposely use that word, and you'll see why in a very short short time. Uh, both of my biological parents were born in Poland in the early 1900s. My, by, uh, my, both of them, both families moved to Belgium between the two world wars, but not at the same time. My mother's family moved much earlier than my father's family. I have absolutely no way of knowing if my parents knew each other in Poland, and I will never, never know. So, when I speak to the kids, but and I and I thought about this, you'll see the uh, last night when I was thinking, how was I going to do this? When I speak to the kids, I tell them always to ask their parents and grandparents for their history, for their stories. Don't ask for facts. Facts you can look up. Everything I am going to be telling you about my parents are facts. But the sad thing about facts is that they all make people flesh and blood. They make them stick figures. You know, facts are facts. That's why some people think history is so boring. I don't personally, but that's because if you just memorize, you know, this happened here, this happened there, and so on, it is boring. But if you know the stories behind it, and actually this is what I thought of last night, Actually, you, many of you are home. You're home with your parents or your parents are home with their children. It's a great time to start t talking to each other, to start telling your stories. Uh, how did you get, you know, if you live in a suburb, how did you get to that suburb? You know, Chicago people have heard of. But uh, and who was the first one to leave 
built Europe, built Asia, built South America to come to America. And why? Those are the things you want to know. How did you pay, how did you meet the adults? And please do it. I, I usually also say ask your parents, grandparents, and so on. But since I'm not sure that anybody is wet grandparents, uh, you definitely are what your children and parents are there. Wonderful time to ask all of this. And I certainly would. Why are you down? And, and all of you who know technology so much more than I do, that's one reason Adina is here, uh, film it, tape it. You really are going to want to know at some time. I could never, never ask my parents any of it. But obviously at some time they met. If they didn't meet in Belgium, I'm sorry, in Poland, then the, and they were uh, both from Lutz, and I know I'm mispronouncing it. If there's any uh, people, uh, you know, who are from Poland watching this, I'm sorry. But why did they leave? And how did they end up in Belgium? Why didn't they end up someplace else? Obviously, I can never ask them all of that, but also obviously they at some point met. So they get married in 1939, the year the war breaks out. And so they are not even a gleam, I am not even a gleam in their eyes when they get married. Then they move to France. Again, I cannot ask them why. I cannot ask them why, I'd love to know why, but who knows? The only thing that might be true, but I'm not sure, is that there is one place that I looked it up, is that my uh, father was in a labor camp in France, but I only saw it in one place. So, you know, I'm taking that with a grain of salt. But anyway, they, uh, they were there, and my older sister, Annette, was born in France. Then at least my mother, I am not sure about my father, because if he was in a labor camp, he certainly could not just leave it. But then my mother, at least with my sister, moved back to Belgium, uh, where I was born in May of 1941. And I always teasingly tell the children, uh, you know, do the math on the bus to figure out how old I am. And just to add some humor, because I try to do that, even though it's a very, very serious subject. Uh, I am not, I once had a very young person say that I was 93. Well, and this was before I was, I was younger than I am now. So I am not 93 yet. But anyway, I am born there. And the very next thing we know is that on Halloween day, October 31st, 1942, my father is put on a transport to Auschwitz. That transport reaches Auschwitz on November 2nd or 3rd, I forgot now, it doesn't matter, 1942. And less than a month that he has been in, uh, in Auschwitz, he is murdered, and I am very, very careful to not use he died, because, look, sad to say we have lost so many people to this virus, but they were not murdered. Nobody killed them, the virus killed them, but, and they died, very sad, and hopefully when it's all over, we'll have more time to mourn them, but that's life. But that's not what happened to him. So if I simply say he died, I diminish everybody who was ever, ever murdered, who were, you know, all the genocides of this, of, that went on, I diminish them. And I don't want to do that. I think it's very important to use the correct word. I used to use perish, but people don't perish, uh, uh, food perishes. So he died. What it did is it left my mother 
with two very little girls still in diapers. What was she going to do uh, to save their lives? Rhetorical question. Now, at this point in the museum, uh, or even at the school, I s usually ask the kids if they have any pets, and usually most of them do. And then I say, I'm going to change it a little, that, uh, well, I won't use his name, <laughs> that uh, America decided that there can be no pets in America. What are you going to do to save your pet? And of course, to the adults there, what if, heaven forbid, this had happened to you, what would you do to save your children? Because I'm sure everybody wants to save their children and their pets. I was very fortunate, excuse me a moment. I was very fortunate that I lived in Belgium because Belgium decided to help save the children. They did not do that well with their adult population, but they did great with their children's population. And there was an organization that helped to hide the children. So uh, uh, what I'm telling you now, it's just what I kind of surmised, not 100% sure, but kind of. Uh, my mother went to the local priest who was in the resistance movement and who did help this organization. And, they, and the woman who, was, who ran it, Andre, uh, and I did meet her once, great woman, she uh, through went to that organization and said, I had, uh, uh, told him what my mother had said, that she had these two little girls and wanted to save them if she could. And so my sister, and so they, they did save us, and my sister and I went into hiding. Now, I always, uh, I compare it somewhat to uh, the, um, uh, oh, my God. so what do I compare it with again? Witness protection program. Oh. <laughs> I can, I, somewhat with the witness protection program. And it wasn't witness protection. Now, I usually, because as I said, I like to involve the kids, involve adults too, that I usually say uh, that I'm looking for two things. And what were the two things that I'm looking for that happens in the witness protection program is that they relocate you and they change your name. And so... That is, of course, what happened to my sister and me. Luckily, we were together. Although my sister had been with another family in Brussels while I was still with my mother. And again, I don't know how my mother knew where my sister was, but my sister and I, uh, uh, my mother and I, I'm sorry, would go visit my sister, and after we left, my sister would just be hysterical. And so uh, my mother took my sister back, and after that, thankfully, we were never separated. We actually, at first, when Andre helped us to uh, be with a family, we obviously, at first, we were with one family, but then they became very afraid that they would be outed, to use that word. And so, they didn't want to keep us anymore. And so, uh, and again, this is an assumption. Uh, the priest had a family that lived in a very small community in Belgium. Rumps, it's closer to Antwerp than it is to Belgium. I'm sorry, to Brussels. And that family said that they would certainly take us. And But what happened is that the original family had kept all our clothes. And, you know, couldn't complain to the police or anything. So our new mother uh, actually made clothes out of newspaper to take us to her house. But then once we got there, everything was fine. Now, I always tell the kids, I don't want them to think of hiding just the way Anne Frank hid. Uh, that certainly is one way of hiding. And there's advantages and disadvantages to it. And we could kind of say that that's what's happening today, that we're hiding the way Anne Frank hid. The 
good thing about that, of course, is that we can talk and we know that there is nobody that's going to come and take us and put us in a concentration camp or in prison. But I always like to make analogies because that then shows, you know, you can connect more. Uh, Now, my sister and I were very lucky with the people who took us in. They loved us, but not all children were that lucky. And whenever uh, I speak, particularly at a school, that line always scares me. That you know, we, uh, we that that family loved us because I don't want anyone to go and tell other people that they heard a survivor story and it wasn't that bad. Look, we lucked out, but no mother should be so afraid that if they keep their children with them, that the government is going to kill both them and their child. And uh, quite a few years ago, I belonged to a hidden children's group, uh, and we wrote this book called Out of Chaos, Hidden Children Remember the Holocaust. Uh, But the reason I'm mentioning it, uh, the first thing that, uh, what opens it up is a poem that I have written. And all I'm going to do is just read one stanza, because I'm talking about hiding and how people hit children. I don't talk about adults. So we hid in homes, we hid in convicts, we hid in orphanages, we hid in basements, we hid in cellars, we hid in haystacks, we hid in barns, we hid in cabinets, we hid in fields, we hid in holes, we hid in in sewers. And so you can see from that list, uh, I'm guessing that there's even more, I just couldn't think of more, that... uh, People hit all over. And the other thing that, you know, as much as this story and what we're going through right now has a lot of similarities, there are some non-similarities too. Uh, Everybody that's now in quarantine, or well, maybe that's the wrong word, but is now staying home, uh, they have all these electronics, I mean, I'm really surprised if some, I know people say it anyway, I'm bored, I have nothing to do. How about reading a book? But that's not even, man, uh, if you take away everything you have, that I, you know, all these electronics, you could watch TV, you can uh, watch films, you could do whatever, you know, you could play games. If you take all of that away, because remember, this was in the 1940s. There was no television, certainly not in Europe, and I don't think in the United States. I don't want to say for sure about that. But many of these kids that were hidden had nothing to entertain themselves. They did not have uh, paper. I mean, I know of one young man who uh, was never able to go outside, and yet he had nothing. He had to learn how to be in his own mind. And so I do want to make sure that you see the difference because no comparison, as I say, is exactly the same. My sister and I, as I said, were very lucky that they loved us. Now, to go back to name changes, I always say, sad to say, names show ethnicity. It should not be sad. All of us should be so proud of our names because we're standing on the shoulders of everyone that came before us. We are who we are today because of all those people who risked, who were upstanders, who took chances. So it certainly should not be anything to be ashamed of. But as as I'm sure some of you in my audience today know that that's true, that if somebody, my biological last name is Lederman, that is definitely a a, 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 um, a Jewish last name. So if somebody, uh, if you were to say to somebody, I have this really nice person I want you to meet, and her name is Marguerite, and we'll just go with Lederman, uh, 
uh, we'll just go with Lederman and what, you know, uh, and the person would say to you, because obviously they don't want to be too uh, nasty. They would say, you know, I'm just way too busy. I can't meet her. They haven't even met me or anybody. And people know that's true. Uh, with all the laws, we can't do it that much. But, uh, you know, people still find ways. Uh-uh, don't do it. Okay. Uh, also, you, the one thing I did not say is obviously if you were able to go outside, which we were, uh, you could, uh, you had to have your religion changed. You know, because obviously if we didn't, we would be, people would know we were Jewish. Not that people did not know. Okay, some people certainly knew. I mean, this was a very small community, and they introduced us as uh, nieces of the husband because it was the mother's community. Uh, so, and, you know, I'm sure people knew that we were not his nieces, although they said we had come there for the good country air and to get away from Brussels. Uh, excuse me to get away from Brussels and so on. But don't, you know, I keep asking you to be upstanders, but there are ways of being upstanders. And, you know, fortunately today, as I said, as I will keep saying, uh, we see it today, and even the news now uh, tells us a lot about uh, people who, you know, the people who have gone out of their way to be good. Uh, so, or to do what, uh, good. Anyway, so nobody in our case told. And how do I know nobody's told? Because, as I said, we were being brought up as Catholic. My sister being the older of the two of us, her class was going to have its first communion. And I would normally ask it again, uh, you know, what do you have to be to be able to take communion? And uh, I would, and you know what you have to be? You have to be baptized. Well, as you know, Jewish people are not baptized. Uh, uh, now, there were children in, during the Holocaust who had been baptized, but I don't know why my sister and I were not baptized. And so the local priest did not allow her to take communion with her class, which is a shame, you know. But the family, because my sister had really been looking forward to it. And, uh, and so they still made my sister a party. But if that didn't do it, something else, you know, didn't tell the rest of the people in the community, I don't know what would. Uh, as for me, by the time I should have taken communion, I was no longer with that family. Now, the next story that I tell, uh, well, part of it is humorous. The kids love it. But part of it is not. And, uh, you know, I usually uh, say to them, uh, there's a saying out there that says sticks and stones can break my bones, but words never will. And I tell them, uh-uh, it's the opposite. Yes, it's true that if, you know, if somebody hits you with something, yeah, you're going to hurt. And if they hit you hard enough, maybe you'll break a bone. But that heals. And fortunately, even pain, once you're out of the pain, you know, be it these poor people who are having the virus today, uh, hopefully by the time they're well again, it will be a memory, or it might take a year in this case, but it will be a memory. What is not a memory is emotional pain. And Linda McCartney has changed that saying to saying sticks and stones can hurt my bones, but words can hurt my heart. And it is true. We don't forget nasty things people said to us. And you'll see why I am saying this. The first part of the story does uh, the saying has nothing to do with. Uh, 
the people that I stayed with owned a cafe. And I would go to the cafe and entertain the soldiers by singing and dancing for them. And no, you cannot ask me. Well, you can't anyway. Skip that. I was like, you can't ask me to do that. And, uh, you know, I, uh, they liked it. And so they were very nice to me. And they would let me take puffs from their cigarettes and sips from their drinks. So here I am, this little two-year-old, two, three-year-old, drinking and smoking. But then I didn't. But I threw up, and so now I do neither. But this does not show anything about the quote. So here, uh, this, this next part is what will show it. I was the favorite of one of these Nazi soldiers, and I was closer to him than I was to anybody else. I mean, to any of the... Uh, well, again, it doesn't make... I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say. I, usually I say I was closer to him than I am to any of you, my audience. I would be sitting on his lap, and he was very kind and, and nice to me. You know, that's the problem. Bad people don't have signs. It'd be wonderful if they did. So, as I said, he was very nice and kind to me. Uh, but... At the same, you know, he would let me play with him, sitting on his uniform, and he would bring me little toys and chocolate. But at the same time that he was so nice and kind to me, he would be tell, saying the most nasty things about Jews. He would say that they were lower than vermin, that they didn't deserve to live, and the line I like best, and please remember where I am, he would say that he could smell a Jew 10 miles away. So what I like to say is that uh, he just couldn't smell close up. You know, but again, in all seriousness, nobody, nobody, nobody smells because of who they are. Yes, we all have body odor. And yes, we all at times perspire and have some odor. But that is because of what we did, not who we are. And, you know, if I cannot, I cannot stress that enough. If that's, I mean, I'd like you to take away quite a few messages, mainly being an upstander and to speak up when you see evil or anything bad happening. But if the only message you take away that is, who we are does not define us as being bad or being places or people not liking us. I mean, it's their problem, not ours. You know, so as I say, yes, we all smell. Uh, but again, it's, you know, we run the ways, we run a marathon, and so on. Somebody... Here we are. No, just go to the next. Okay. Okay, now... The next part, actually, the kids seldom hear because I don't have this much time. Uh, I don't know how my mother knew where we were. And, you know, there's a part of me that is angry at her because I want to say to her, how could you do this? You put your children into safety and then you risk their lives, and not only their lives, but the lives of the people that took them in, and your own life, because she would come and visit us. I don't know how often, I have no memory of her visiting us, but the, the, the family had a daughter who was home, she was about 15 years old, so she certainly had a good memory, and she told me this story. Now, you would think that when my mother came to visit us, my sister and I would run up to her and say, oh, please, please take us home. And that would have been very painful for her. But what my sister and I did was so much more painful for her. And it was so cruel and not because we were mean and cruel children. Again, if I were talking to you at the museum or even someplace else, I would have pictures I could show you to show you how cute we were, because that's what I usually say at that time. But because we were children, and unlike even 10-year-olds, and certainly above that age, adults, we didn't have the words 
to tell her how we felt. But we certainly knew how we felt. And, you know, this isn't nice, but we're all human. When someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. Not because we're nasty, but because we want them to feel our pain. So, that, you know, and we were very angry at our mother. She had deserted us. She had left us. She had abandoned us. What kind of mother abandons their children? And I, look, I don't think that as an adult, we're talking about my child's mind. So the best way to hurt her is she didn't need us, we didn't need her. So instead of running up and kissing her, we did, we instead ignored her completely and made nice, nice to our new mother. And that had to have been so painful for her. And, you know, kids sometimes ask, uh, if you could change one thing, what would you change? And I always say, well, I'm not going to say the war because that's just too big, you know. Uh, but I think this is one of the things I would change. Anyway, she was supposed to have said that she was very happy because she now knew that her children were well taken care of and loved. But oh, how painful it had to have been for her. And my mother really is the saddest person in my story. She was taken on the very last transport from Belgium. She was taken on July 31st, 1944. And that transport reached Auschwitz on <laughs> on August 2nd, 1944. And she is murdered there uh, sometime in December. Unlike my father, where I have an exact date of birth, I'm sorry, of murder, for my mother, I do not. Now, I forgot to mention that I think that my father was gassed because in for two, they were already using the gas chambers. They were not running as efficiently as they would later on when they could murder thousands of people in you know, one time. But to make anything run more efficiently or be more efficient, you have to experiment. You have to try things as we're trying with the virus. But so I, I don't think my mother was murdered in the gas chambers because by December of 44, the Nazis knew they were losing the war and they were trying to actually close the camps So because they knew the Russians were advancing. So I don't know how. But as I said, she is murdered there sometime in December of 44 and the Soviet Union liberates Auschwitz in January of 45. It leaves my sister and me as orphans. And for us, it got much, much worse after the war. And I'll show you how, or I'll tell you how. This wonderful family that had taken us in wanted to keep us. And they went to the local priest and they asked, you know, they said we want to keep these two young girls, and he said no. And supposedly, this I don't know, uh, my mother was supposed to have told the family that if she did not come back, she wanted them to keep us. Didn't happen. So we, uh, so we did stay with them for a while longer because meanwhile, the Jewish agencies were looking for all the hidden children. They knew there were hidden children. And as much as I don't give statistics that much, uh, I will, in this case, I'm sorry, I have to cough. <coughs> they, uh, at the beginning of World War II, there were three million children in Europe. I don't talk about any place else. By the end of World War II, a million and a half of those children had been murdered, and only because they were Jewish. 
They had not done anything to deserve that punishment. What they had done was be born into the wrong religion. That's all. So the Jewish agency certainly goes looking for the children because as we all know, the children are the future. That's why we should all at least be somewhat thankful that this awful virus does not hit children as much as it hit older people and adults. Because uh, they're our future. We want them to know, you know, to be good and strong. Anyway, so they knew where my sister and I were. So they finally decided to put my sister and me into a Jewish orphanage. And if you don't think that was traumatic, it was. You know, even again, using what's going on today, all the, the, <laughs> the governors that I he hear uh, are saying, uh-uh, we don't just say you could all go out and that's the end of it. They're going to phase things in because it gives you more time to adjust. So uh, this was not going to give us any time to adjust. So the woman who we really thought was our mother, you have to understand this, because we were very young and we'd been with her longer than we had been with our biological mother. So she ends up taking us to the orphanage. And the one thing she asked of them when she got there was for them not to cut our hair. And they promised they would not. And if I, was if I could see all of you, I would say to you, what is the first thing they did? And I know you're all gonna answer, cut our hair. That was very traumatic for me. You know, you might not think so. Uh, you might think, think so what? What's her hair got to do with anything? But remember, I was about five at this time. And this woman who I thought was my mother was leaving me in this awful, awful place. It was a dark place. You know, it wasn't warm. There was no warmth in it. And as a child, Again, I couldn't verbalize, but I could certainly think. And what do children think? They never think that it's the adult's uh, fault or reason. In this case, it wasn't really her fault. But they always think that they did something wrong. So again, you know, what is so wrong with me that my biological mother gives me up and now this woman who's been so nice and loving to me gives me up. There must be something intrinsically wrong with me to have people giving me up all the time. But if I had lived with that, if I had verbalized that, I would be in trouble. Uh, I may be a little crazy now, but I don't think I could be talking to you if I'd lived with that. So what I did is I substituted I took the haircut as the thing to be upset about. How could they cut my hair when they promised they would not? Notice that's why I have a very hard time cutting my hair, even these days. And of course, I could see why, uh, as an adult again, I could see why. Because, you know, they, they thought that there was lice in our hair. Now, I don't believe there was in my sister's and my hair. I can't swear to it. But in our book, and I'm sure you are out of chaos, and I'm sure in other books also, and people said that after about a week, they had lice. So, you know, looking back, of course, they could have handled it differently. They didn't have to insult a woman. They could simply have said, uh, it's just easier to take care of short hair, but it's always easier to, uh, it's always easier uh, you know, in retrospect, to say what you could do. But as I said, for, and this was such a hard, awful beginning to, uh, you know, even going into that orphanage. Now, the thing I did not realize till much, much later is that the people taking care of us were Holocaust survivors. And most probably... Uh, and most probably they uh, 
had been in the camps. So they had nothing to give to us. They were in need, they were so much in need of tender, loving care themselves that they had nothing to give, not only to me, but to all the children there. Because any of us, I don't care how bad your hiding experience was, it does not compare to, uh, to, uh, to being in the camps. I, I usually say, and this is like a misnomer, uh, that even the best, and that's where the misnomer comes in, a concentration camp so, uh, you know, experience was worse than the worst hiding experience. So, I, again, as an adult, I can understand everything, but not as a child. They gave us up. How could they do that? You know, and so those years in the orphanage were miserable. They, uh, you know, I could give you a few examples and some I know uh, happened here too. I'm not saying they didn't, but you'll see, I am left-handed. I mean, you see, I'm picking up my water with my left hand. So, uh, and I know this happened in America also. So what happened was, of course, when and we did start going to school in Europe. And so what happened was that they forced me to write with my white hand. And as I said, I know it happened here too. They literally tied my back, my uh, left hand in back of me. And then, you know, I had no choice. And so that's one example. Now, this, and all I'm trying to do is give you examples of how miserable for me the orphanage was. And so, uh, I am very particular about what I eat. If I don't like something, skip it. Yes, I would rather starve than eat something I don't like. You know, for all you parents who say, well, you know, if you don't eat this, that's it. But so what happened is, they, uh, for lunch, we had had barley soup. I hate barley soup. <laughs> so if, if any of you ever invite me to your house, don't give me any barley soup. But anyway, in all seriousness, um, and I wouldn't eat it. And, and so they would not let me eat anything else for lunch. I was either going to eat that soup or nothing. And so I didn't eat it. And when lunch was over, um, you know, we all went to do whatever we did. And, and then when we were playing, uh, one little girl, I don't know how she got an apple, but she got an apple and she gave it to me. And one of the matrons saw me eating it and she knocked it out of my hand. So much for, you know, and then for dinner, everybody else is eating whatever they were serving. Guess what they put in front of me? You got it, the barley soup. And by now, I wouldn't feed that soup to my dog. You know, because they hadn't really eaten it, so you know how ugh, it looked. And so again, I wouldn't eat it. They sent me to bed without food. They did let me eat the next day. They weren't going to let me starve. Now, one of the nice things that happened, semi-nice, uh, is that they took pictures of all of us, sent them to America, you know, visual pictures, so that some group could foster us. And so uh, I was fortunate. I did have a group that fostered me. And um, they started sending me gifts. And some of it was clothing. I have uh, in my uh, records uh, where I thanked them uh, for sending underwear and things like that. And I said much of it was too big on me. So I shared it with the older girls. Uh, but the two things I got was a doll, which is now at the uh, U.S. Holocaust Museum, and also a ball. Uh, I, I'm looking at the time, and I know I have to go faster. And uh, anyway, and we had, and the orphanage roof was flat. And so 
I would not let anyone play with my ball. You know, I mean, it was like a brand new thing. It was so shiny and everything. Well, one of the boys asked me if he could play with it. And I, of course, said no. And so he, he went and he told one of the matrons. And she told me I had to let him play with it. And, I, and uh, you know, all the, ball, the balls that uh, he played, and of course, it went with what I like to call uh, uh, the, the, the roots I call it ball heaven. It went to ball heaven. But let me uh, get kind of start finishing. Uh, uh, so I'm going to get me to America. Uh, in 1949, the orphanage was going to Israel. The, unbeknownst to my sister and me, there were, was a couple in Chicago, no blood relation at all, who have uh, 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 who have decided to adopt us, but the paperwork to come to America had not been completed, so we couldn't come, and we certainly couldn't stay in Belgium because the Jewish agency was paying for us to go to Israel, where we where we would become wards of the state, and in those days they would not have left let us leave. So we're all on the train, which is going to take us to the uh, ship that's going to take us to Israel. And in the midst of the desolate countryside, the train stopped. And two Belgium, uniformed Belgian policemen get aboard. And I knew instantly that they were there for my sister and me. And sure enough, they came over and they took us off. Now, it is not as simple as it sounds. It's not them coming to us, taking us off, and we say, okay, uh, you know, we say to the rest of the children on the train, nice knowing you, maybe we'll see you again. If not, have a great life. Uh, uh, uh. We're not going, not going, not going. We had moved around enough in our short lives. And this was it, you know, either this or, but as, as I always tell the kids, no one listens to children. So they took us off that train kicking and screaming because what had happened was that the family of the couple, they did not have any other children, that the couple in Chicago had said that they would pay for our stay in Belgium while the rest of the paperwork went on. And uh, the social worker that arranged this adoption, who was in Belgium, said to, uh, to the Michigans, uh, or wrote this to the Michigans, that $50 would certainly cover it. And when you think that that was going to house and feed two little girls, you know, no way would that happen today. But it did. Uh, so... Uh, we did indeed go to another orphanage for another six months. Because uh, uh, we also, I mean, what also happened is we had to wait at a way station and these poor, poor uh, uh, policemen, I mean, you know, they weren't mean or anything. Uh, because my sister and I just kept crying and crying. Then they gave us, then they gave us, uh, then they gave us uh, uh, some chocolate, and my sister, and uh, so of course you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, eat and cry at the same time. Try it sometimes. <laughs> anyway, and so we both, of course, ate the chocolate. We're not fools, but my sister, she was always more docile, so everything came somewhat easier to her. For me, it always was very difficult. Uh, but my, uh, my sister then stopped crying, not yours truly. I kept crying and crying. But anyway, we went to a way state. We went then, they, you know, then when another train came to take us back into Brussels, we went to yet another orphanage. And actually, uh, at that address, it had been the first orphanage we had gone to. Then they combined orphanages. Anyway, so we went there. And then we came 
to the United States in May of 1950. And we came on a Saturday. And the people that were adopting us were Orthodox. So I still feel that we landed, or not landed, that we uh, docked at uh, Ellis Island, but maybe not. Oh, I did. Part of the reason it took so long for us to come wasn't only the paperwork. It's they had to find somebody who would uh, watch us on the uh, ship. So they did find this woman. Then there was a, th- a little boy also. He was going to get off in Canada. The, sh- uh, the ship stopped in Canada. And the reason I mentioned the woman is uh, she was allowed to bring her dog on the ship. And, you know, we know even today we're not allowed to bring our dogs on the ship or on cruises as much as we would like to. And the reason she was allowed to bring her dog is because her dog had saved her life during the war. She had been hiding underground in a hole and he would cover her up in the daytime. Then at night he would go scurry looking for food. So that's why. But anyway, so we stopped in... in a, a, in Canada for a day, then we came to the United States. And we landed on a, not landed, docked on a uh, Saturday. And the people were uh, Orthodox. So this organization, Hayes, there were people there waiting for my sister and me. And they took us to the hotel where my new parents were waiting for us. But let me tell you, it was was scary. You know, here we were meeting people we had never met before. And so we were both scared. And then, uh, I mean, some humorous things happened. Uh, When my adoptive father, uh, you know, we were eating in the hotel, so we had breakfast. And uh, I put way too much salt on the eggs. So, of course, I, I pushed the plate to my adoptive mother. But when he, my adoptive father, when he left the tip on the table, I went back and got it because I didn't know what it was for. I thought he'd left the money there. And, and then in the elevator, I was always so afraid that they would, uh, you know, that they, he would not, in those days, now for the kids, I know this isn't going to make sense, but the adults who remember elevator operators, it will. Uh, I was very afraid that it wouldn't stop at our floor. So I would say about two or three floors before ours, I would yell, halt! And everybody in the elevator liked that a lot. But anyway, we came to Chicago and, uh, you know, and uh, even though we came in May, our adoptive mother uh, sent us to school, and uh, and I had just turned nine, a- and um, and so uh, in the morning uh, they uh, in the morning they put me in my white grave, uh, and and that was fine. But in the afternoon they put me in first grade. I can understand why, by the way. Not then, but again now. Those first graders certainly knew a lot more than I knew. You know, they knew English, and I certainly did not. But for me, it was an assault on my dignity. How dare they put me, you know, uh, in first grade with those little babies when I'm a big girl. So I sat in that poor classroom every day and cried. And today, of course, a teacher couldn't do this because, you know, if you touch a kid even nicely, who knows? And so what happened is that, uh, yeah, but she would put her hands down my face. And so, uh, and so I, I'm sure she was asking me why I was crying, but I didn't have the words to tell her that. So, uh, you know, but then by uh, the worst thing, not the worst. uh, You keep going. Okay. The worst, uh, one of the worst things, now I've, uh, that, uh, you know, 
Oh, yeah. The worst thing that my sister and I ever did was we said to each other, we will not use the French word unless we cannot think of the English word. And by September, we knew no French. That's another thing I would change if I had my life to, li to live over. So, uh, but, you know, obviously I grew up and it's kind of where I end my story. But as I told you at the beginning, I have some messages. I do have a few questions from people. Uh, so, uh, you know, everybody is familiar with the number six million, which sometimes makes me very sad because it's just too big a number. What we need is individuals. There's a, a group that does this thing called names, not numbers, and that's what we need. You know, even now when they announce how many people have died of the virus, it is overwhelming. But when they say, when they give individual stories, that's not overwhelming. That we can understand and sympathize with. But anyway, everybody you know, knows that number. But you have to also know that millions and millions of other people were murdered. And I'm just going to name the groups. And what I usually say, which is true, uh, with the exception of political prisoners, and that was their choice, not say they weren't born that way. Uh, all the others uh, were not their choice. Nobody chooses to be born uh, as a Jehovah Witness. Yes, you might change your religion, but if you're born into it, nobody, and this for sure, nobody, uh, nobody uh, chooses to be a gypsy. And I personally think that the next group is not a choice. If you do, let's just agree to disagree, uh, to be a homosexual or gay if you, you know, we want both male and female. And, but those were the people who were murdered, just because, and of course, Jews. So uh, what I always say is, you might not belong to any of the four groups I just mentioned, but you know what? If somebody is prejudiced, I, uh, they're, they're going to get to your group. And so you really have to speak up. And, you know, there's this very, very famous quote. I know. There's this very, very famous quote that says, uh, first they came for the communist. And I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. Then they came, I think, for the labor unions. I wasn't in the labor unions. I didn't say anything. Then they came for the Jews. I wasn't Jewish. But then they came for me, and there was no one to speak up. You have got to speak up. And I usually say to the kids, and then I will end it, look, I cannot make anybody like some group if they don't like that group. But all I ask is that you treat that group with respect. You all have to be friends with them if you don't want to, but treat them with respect. I personally think the more different type of people you associate with, the richer your life is. But... You can, you know, you can definitely do what you want. I can't force anybody. Okay, um, I'm being told by Adina that I have some questions. So, uh, Courtney asks, what's the scariest part about coming to America? And have you ever wanted to move back to Europe? Okay, the scariest part about coming to America is that well, of course, I didn't know. And the only person I had was my sister. And also, as much as I have shown you how awful the uh, orphanage was, remember, I'd been with those people for so long. And, and you know, I knew what to do. It was very scary to meet new people. And uh, you know how they have planks on uh, to get off a ship? And... I was afraid to get off. At first, I kept thinking I was afraid to get off because uh, I might fall through those planks. But looking back, that wasn't it. I was too big already. I was nine years old, you know. What it was is that I knew on some level that once I crossed, once I went off that ship, 
everything that was behind me would always be behind me. I, you know, that I had no way of going back. And that was scary. And the second part was if I ever thought of living in Europe. Would you ever go back to Europe? I have gone back a few times. I have it now, I think, since uh, maybe oh two. Uh, obviously, the original family that I stayed with is dead, and their children are all dead. Uh, they do have two grandchildren. Uh, and, uh, they might have more, but they, they're two granddaughters, I should say. One who is named after me. Uh, they call her Margot, but that's what I, they called me uh, when I was with them. And my poor sister, I didn't know she was jealous, but we one time discussed this. Uh, she said that she was upset that they didn't name anybody else uh, after me. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead. The last we have... question is, you were asked, what's your favorite teaching book for the Holocaust? Whoa, what a question. I, uh, you know, I don't want to say, well, I'm turning it over to, uh, to the museum, but at the museum, certainly, there are people who know way more. Uh, I, you know, the reason I'm having such a hard time, I know that they use night a lot, and of course, he also has another book. They, I know they use Eli Weisel a lot, uh, but I think it depends on the child's age. The, the adult, I mean, there are just so many. I wish I could tell you, but I can't. You know, uh, you know, I mean, it, uh, very quickly, I was a teacher for Chicago, and uh, I had to do a, an oral test. Uh, I passed a written and so on. And they asked me a question, like, what books would I use, uh, uh, you know, to teach Shakespeare? And I was so nervous <laughs> that I simply said, I can't think of any right now, but uh, I would, you know, I would know to go to the library. I do have to have something. Thank you again for tuning in. Join us here next Tuesday at 10 a.m. to hear Holocaust survivor, survivor Ralph Rebach share his story. Uh, that's uh, Remembrance Day, by the way, next Tuesday. Please keep an eye on Illinois Holocaust Museum's Facebook uh, and other social media accounts where we will post a stream of content through the weeks ahead. Thank you for your support during these extraordinary times. And hopefully, when everything comes back, you will uh, be able to go to the museum and see it because that really brings it home. And thanks to everybody who listened. Bye-bye. <laughs>